everyone. Welcome to you all to our virtual debate on digital innovation in the European creative and cultural sectors. It's so great to see that so many of you have registered for this debate. We expect over 80 participants this morning, including EIF members and representatives from uh, EU institutions. My name is Maria Rosa Gibellini. I'm Director General at EIF and your moderator today. As you know, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers with us, but before I introduce them, please let me quickly remind you of the house rules to ensure the best possible particip participation from the audience as well. All attendees are on mute right now and not visible, but there will be a Q&A session after all the speeches, and you will be also able to ask a question. In order to do so, please use the raise hand function on the WebEx app. You will find it under the participants tab at the bottom. You will uh, be given the floor when it's your turn and you will be unmuted. When you're asking your question, please don't forget to share your organization's name and specify which speaker you're addressing in particular. For your information, this debate will be recorded, but the Q&A session won't be disclosed. Now, without uh, further ado, please let me walk you through our program and welcome our speakers. We will start with uh, Sabine Ferrayen, MEP, Chairwoman of the European Parliament's Culture and Education Committee and member of the EIF Steering Committee. Sabine will take the floor in a moment to kick off the debate and will be followed by Francesco Ronchi, President and CEO of the Digital Factory Synesthesia, Gian Piero Lutito, founder and CEO of Facility Live, Antonio Nicoletti, General uh, Director at the Regional Agency for Territorial Development of Basilicata in Italy, Sophie Burkhardt, Deputy Director Manager at FUNC, a German video on demand service. Last but not least, we will hear from Magnus Nistrom. Vice President of Technical Operations and IT at the Nordic Entertainment Group. Sabine, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Maria Rosa. Uh, first, I would also like to welcome all the participants uh, warmly to our debate on culture and uh, creative industries and uh, the digital development we are facing there. But please allow me first to say also something uh, about the actual crisis and the situation where we find the cultural and creative sector at the moment. Two months ago, as the coronavirus began to spread, the majority of member states introduced restrictive measures to protect the citizens' health. In the cultural sector, we have seen cinemas, big concert halls and small venues, theaters and museums close their doors. Many festivals, conferences, book fairs, and film and television productions have been cancelled or at least postponed until further notice. The European cultural and creative sectors are facing a profound and unprecedented crisis, the consequences of which will be long lasting and may be devastating for many operators, especially those that depend directly on a live audience, such as theatres, cinemas, festivals, etc. For the time being, it is not yet possible to evaluate or quantify the economic impact on the sector, but we know already that it will be devastating. Many cultural operators may not survive. The cultural and creative sector is populated primarily by small business and individual artists, but artists, museums and cultural operators have not downed tools. Uh, and I salute the incredible response from the sector for example, in generously sharing their performances and collections online. There were so many initiatives made by museums, by single artists who showed their own uh, works and uh, uh, made performances online. Uh, but what's important there, uh, if we use these online, yeah, um, these online offers, uh, normally they were not paid so that the artist didn't get a revenue out of that. So it was just for, for, for good for, for, for people, but uh, it's not really helping the sector uh, to be refinanced. So what we need are solutions, solutions, online solutions in the long term, in the long term, but also actually that help the sector 
to find new ways of distribution of works distribution of performing arts distribution of live performances and uh, there uh, the digital development uh, is, is a very important tool i'm also here today to listen to your suggestions and ideas on what is needed from the european level to assist support uh, uh, the sectors in this change I look forward to you to discuss with you the changes, the evolution and future shifts occurring within the creative and cultural sectors in Europe, with a focus on the online consumer experience and showcasing how the sectors are evolving to assist and change with the COVID-19 crisis, bringing content to Europeans and planning for the post-crisis reality. But not just the distribution, but also the creation of works is more and more uh, uh, made also in a digital manner. We have a mixture between handwork, handcrafted uh, arts and culture, but also uh, using digital things. When I go to the movie industry, taking a look on what's going on there with virtual reality and uh, artificial intelligence tools for making movies, um, there are so many things in development. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, very, very um, challenging on the one hand, but also a very big chance especially for the cultural and creative sector uh, to have uh, the right approach in the digitization. And uh, I'm looking forward to an interesting input from your side as specialists, but also to an interesting uh, discussion, what we also as politicians can do to build up, to set up the right frame that the cultural and creative sector can benefit from the development in the digital uh, uh, area. And I think it's a quite, quite important discussion we are going to lead today. Many thanks for being online with us and I'm looking forward to a very interesting and open discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabine. And now over to Francesco Ronchi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having, for having me. My name is Francesco Ronchi. Uh, let's see if the, if the lights are working. Okay. Okay, very good. Oops. Okay, um, I'm uh, an entrepreneur. I founded uh, Synesthesia uh, nine years ago. Synesthesia is a spastic growing company uh, in Italy on the digital in the digital transformation uh, uh, sector. We we develop software. Uh, we do research and development uh, uh, in innovative projects as well. Uh, but uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about our commitment in the events and training sector uh, and uh, in uh, our academy. Um, well, what happened? Of course, uh, COVID-19 forced us uh, uh, to, to change our perspective. Our first priority was safety, as everyone, uh, but uh, then we slowed down our, our activities, starting to think. Uh, and a lot of questions arose uh, about what's going to happen to us, to our business. Uh, and uh, we faced uh, a large uncertainty in front of us. So we had to react. Uh, um, in, in Italy, Italy was uh, uh, strongly hit by COVID-19, one of the strongest, uh, uh, the hardest hit countries in Italy, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, also one of the countries with the largest digital divide. Uh, so the social distancing um, was, was, a, was a large problem, of course, for the creative and cultural sector. And the sector was uh, largely unprepared to the use of digital uh, solution, digital tools uh, that become the, the, new, the new normal, uh, they, are, they are the new normal today. So uh, we need this cultural shift uh, in the sector, also uh, in the industry, but, uh, but uh, in the public as well. Um, education has always been uh, in the core of uh, our activities, uh, both for ourselves and, and uh, as, a, as a service that we provided. And we were already running a large number of uh, educational initiatives before COVID-19. Um, specifically in our Synesthesia Academy, uh, we were providing uh, classes on uh, soft skills and hard skills on uh, digital. Uh, specifically, uh, we, uh, we were running Future Makers, that's a, a school uh, for kids uh, on digital and technology 
topics uh, like uh, electronics, robotics, coding, uh, and of course, computational thinking. And we, we were also running uh, uh, Stack. that's uh, an initiative, an event designed to, to uh, close the gender gap in the technology uh, sector. Uh, that's very important uh, at the moment, uh, and to get girls interested in technology, uh, technology topics and coding and other subjects. So this is what's going, what was going on before the crisis, and uh, how did we react? Well, we launched Future Maker at Home, so we move uh, online all the Future Maker activities. Uh, uh, providing weekly, uh, both paid and free uh, training sessions to children, to kids, uh, ranging from 3D modeling uh, to uh, game creation to uh, graphics, uh, design, and a lot of topics, uh, different topics. And with our academy, we also partner with local government uh, in order to provide uh, free seminars and, and, and education to educators and, uh, and teachers uh, about the digital technologies to allow them to take, take advantage of, of digital technology. So we went completely from an offline to an online, uh, uh, totally online uh, activity in, in this area, uh, focusing on, the, on digital, not just as a, as a medium, but uh, also and especially as a subject of education. So this is what's going on right now uh, with all the kids uh, following uh, uh, the seminars online. And uh, we also started a no-profit uh, initiative called the Tutti Connessi. We support this initiative and I personally started uh, the initiative as well. The, the um, goal is to fill the, the gender, the, sorry, the, the digital divide uh, for families that are socially fragile and without income, because we saw that a lot of families in Italy uh, have this problem uh, into uh, getting the, the, the kids uh, online and, and uh, because they don't have the connection, they don't have the digital tools, the, the PC, the tablet uh, in house. And so we try to fill this gap by uh, starting this initiative that is recycled recycles uh, hardware donated by the individuals and, and companies and donates them to the school and to the, and to the students. Uh, what are the, are the outcomes that, that come from uh, all of this? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we saw that bringing online uh, and using digital tools uh, um, for, for our initiative uh, had, had the advantage of multiplying opportunities. Uh, our, our audience, for example, uh, become um, nationwide from, from a local uh, audience became, became nationwide uh, and we had a lot of new opportunities of course uh, this requires a lot of investment uh, on our side we expect this investment to return in terms of visibility in terms of awareness uh, and increased competencies but uh, um, we show this this uh, commitment uh, also by providing uh, these free resources and uh, support to, to uh, no-profit projects as well. This investment probably uh, can be uh, supported only by the small and, and medium enterprises. This, uh, there is a need for, uh, for investment by, by the public sector. And uh, well, in conclusion, uh, COVID-19 forced, forced this change of perspective, but also put uh, uh, the digital divide under the spotlight. The digital divide is still dramatic in, in every level, and not uh, just in the, the educational sector, but especially uh, in this sector, it's, it's dramatic. Uh, we need the long-term view to overcome this crisis uh, and we need investment as well. Uh, but even small, uh, small and uh, medium enterprises like Synesthesia have the ability to grow in this moment uh, um, and uh, take advantage of, of the digital, the digital uh, solution that multiply opportunities uh, uh, to, to have a larger impact. Uh, some of the changes we are facing now are going to stay even after the COVID-19. And so uh, we will need to be prepared uh, and to start now to uh, build what's going to be 
the new normal and to react uh, uh, to what is going to happen in the next uh, months and the next years. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. Very clear. Uh, now over to Giampiero Lottito. I remind all the speakers to please be brief in the interest of time to allow more time for the Q&A session later. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the the COVID-19 uh, is a very particular experience. I am speaking uh, from Pavia, Pavia in Lombardy is the city where was hospitalized the patient one of the Italian epidemic. So we are in the center of uh, uh, this uh, experience uh, and uh, I am at home since uh, more than 80 days. So uh, I am experimenting directly what is the COVID-19 uh, uh, online experience. And uh, for sure, it is an accelerator of many processes because uh, we are beginning to listen, to speak about uh, digital sovereignty, about uh, digital uh, uh, access to uh, information that normally were not uh, nor, um, used online. For example, culture. No? Museum, theaters, concerts are things that we were used to uh, uh, to approach uh, in, in a live experience and not in an online experience. Now uh, we are speaking how to change this approach to information. So this acceleration can be uh, useful to uh, create what Europe miss since uh, decades, not years. For example, uh, a set of European technologies, digital technologies that can uh, allow Europe to be uh, not a follower in, a, in the digital world, but a protagonist, a full protagonist. Uh, the problem of the last uh, uh, 10 to 20 years was that Europe uh, was using uh, technology produced elsewhere uh, in, in the two blocks, two big blocks, uh, in, uh, Western and Eastern. Uh, but now uh, we need to have uh, our companies, our technologies, our culture respected in uh, this uh, uh, future. So. Uh, three main uh, matters are important. First, base technology, base platforms, not derivated from other base technology produced elsewhere. We need uh, the European technologies and we need European tech champions, uh, companies able to make the traction for the whole entire ecosystem uh, to uh, allow Europe to be leader in, uh, in the world because it is the biggest market and the culture of Europe needs to have its independency, technology independency in, uh, in this future. So, base platform and base technology, tech champions, ecosystem builders, uh, companies, uh, technologies that are able to build ecosystem, for example, in the culture sector, in the uh, in the creative sector, uh, allowing a, a new way to approach the problem, allowing a new way to use, uh, for example, uh, uh, the 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 cultural experience uh, at home or uh, in other uh, ways. Uh, and this can have also a new uh, kind of ecosystem that uh, is concentrated in uh, small concentrated valleys, many in Europe, that we name small valleys. Uh, to close my intervention, we in Facility Live aim to be one of the tech champions in Europe particularly in cultural sector 
and creative sector because we have a base platform uh, patented in 46 countries around the world and we aim also to be an ecosystem builder uh, in the uh, cultural cre creative section and we hope that the acceleration of the COVID-19 experience would allow to us and other companies like us to realize this project to be tech champions, European tech champions. Thank you. I gave five seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Giampiero. And now over to Antonio Nicoletti, please. Thank you very much. I am here to bring the experience of a city which is uh, Matera in southern Italy, and it has been the European capital of culture in 2019. Matera is one of the oldest cities in the world, and its urban environment is characterized by being carved into stone. People lived in caves until recent times, and in the urban rebirth of last 10 years, people started again to live in caves and to work in caves uh, like it was uh, in uh, millennia, throughout millennia. So what happened? Matera was capital, European capital of culture uh, for many reasons, but one of these uh, is linked to a new relations that has been developed in putting together the very old, the ancient town and contemporary art and contemporary creativity. It was like having generative uh, energy coming out from the urban environment and creativity of people in this place. Throughout the year of being capital of culture, something happened. We discovered that this kind of generative energy was also transferable, transferable to innovation and technology. So uh, the administration and some, uh, uh, some uh, technological actors, some uh, uh, facilitators and also some innovator, innovators like Giampiero, Lotito, for instance, uh, worked together in order to build a, a legacy that could go after the European, after the big event of the European Capital of Culture and set new challenges and new pathways for urban development based on the relation between not anymore only place and art, place and people, but also place and technology place and innovation. Now that COVID-19 has changed everything in our lives, this is still more actual and it uh, also um, uh, develops new ways of pushing forward innovation. And what I mean uh, is uh, that if before technologies could bring, um, could bring us uh, through augmented reality, for instance, additional services in our real and normal life. Nowadays, uh, technology can bring is essential services in our reduced lives. And this is a, a, our, our meeting is an example. This can mean something very important in creative in the creative sector, because through technology, we can see and we can open up uh, the future for uh, um, for workers in cultural sector um, and uh, for instance the enhancement enhancement of audience um, is something that has to be uh, even uh, it has to be reset for the uh, well uh, being also of artists. Um, the challenge is to join real life and the displaced audience that can be wherever. So in order to get to the uh, last point of my, uh, of my uh, talk, um, what we are doing now 
uh, is to work on these possibilities through um, a new project we, that we call uh, the House of Emerging Technologies of Matera. This is a place where innovators will gather together um, and also institutions will gather together, the Ministry of Economic Development with the administration of Matera and with the research centers. And we use 5G, we use uh, IoT, we use a mixed reality in order to develop new solutions to these challenges, challenging times. And also, uh, the last point is that these experiences are uh, uh, growing in the periphery of Europe. Uh, COVID-19 has taught us that even periphery is, if there is technology, it is no use anymore to talk about center and periphery. Wherever we are, we can be innovator and wherever we are, we can push forward uh, the opportunities for mankind to develop. So I think that I have finished my time and I thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. Very, very interesting. Uh, now over to uh, Sophie Workhart, please. Hello from Germany. Um, I am Sophie Burkhardt and um, I hope you can see my uh, presentation now. Um, I will talk to you about funk and just to say it once, uh, this has nothing to do with funk music, but it's a pun on Rundfunk, so the German term for broadcast. Um, funk is part of the German public broadcast system, so we invented it in 2016 and in Germany we had a problem many European countries face it was hard for us to reach young audiences with public television or radio. So we were assigned by the German and federal states with the task to develop a concept for 14 to 29 year olds. Um, our aim is to fulfill their democratic, cultural and social needs. That's what is written in our founding treaty and we take it very seriously. So how do we do this? We are no TV or radio channel. Instead, we distribute our content where our users can see it or hear it. So on social media, on our own web app and on third platform, party platforms. Currently, um, we offer over 70 different shows in three different categories. So we have orientation, information and entertainment. And you probably know that it's hard to reach young people as a traditional media player. So there's always the danger of being the creepy old guy trying to approach young people. So that's why we choose to build a real network where every talented young person or young producer in Germany can be part of. So it is not us creating every show, but we try to give space to creativity and talent. And this makes it also easier for us now to publish content in the current uh, COVID crisis because we have a very flexible organization that can work and publish remotely. Content is king, so it was never our aim to have a fancy brand, but to have successful content. And this is determining the brand. Um, depending on the platform, our content has different publication cycles and distribution concepts. So we know the platforms we are working for very well. And um, of course, interaction is very important. So how is it working? Um, Sophie, yeah. excuse me to interrupt. Um, I'm afraid we don't see your slides. Oh. So if you um, if you accept the presenter's rights, you should I, be able to I try, share. I try it once again. So yes yeah. no so yes, thank you ah uh, that's good because it's now um you can see the the statistics so it's perhaps easier to follow so um in the um how is it working um better than i personally would have thought in the beginning to be honest so we have a study every year where we check how many people know what we are doing and these numbers are growing every year. So uh, in the last year, 73% of young people in Germany knew what we did. And uh, if you see how it is used, we have um, around 3.8 million views on YouTube per day. So that's around uh, 1 billion per year. And um, you can see YouTube is the most important platform for us. But as you can see, the numbers 
and Instagram are also growing. And we um, decided to experiment more on Snapchat podcasts and on our own platforms this year. So what's the difference between Funk and a commercial network? I want to explain this a bit further. Um, the first thing is what we can do can't be monetized. So many creators who approach us want to do shows about politics or science, and they know that it would be impossible to make a living on this on YouTube. So this is not the kind of content you can do product placements in or even place pre-rolls, etc. So if you really want to get fully involved in this project, doing deep researches, uh, check, fa check facts and so on, um, we have, are the perfect partner to make this possible and even help through our network to create a greater reach. So if you look below the statistics, you see how much time our users spend um, in the beginning of Funk and and you see that information is growing. So we are now on a um, basis where half of the time spent with Funk is orientation and information. And this is because um, we use our entertainment content to push information and at the same time we see that the young public really likes to watch our information content because it's something we only can offer um another thing is that we can be truly independent we see there's many there's much sponsored content on youtube and um it's different it's difficult for the young audiences to find something independent so uh, this is really something they they like about us and um, it's shown too that if you show both sides of a subject, give information about sources, etc., they really appreciate it. And last point, um, as we use intermediaries like YouTube, Facebook, and so on, we can explain how they work. So for us, being independent means being independent on the platform of the platforms we're working on too. So the fact that we use YouTube um, doesn't mean that we don't criticize YouTube. Last year, we had a highlight project called uh, DarkTube and different channels of our network showed the dark sides of YouTube, like radicalization of the network, uh, networks of pedophiles, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And we could do this because we even if we use YouTube, we still are independent because we're public broadcaster and um, we can do this and our community is appreciating, uh, appreciating this a lot. And we understand the platforms better. So because we use them, we know how it is working, when there are problems, and we can give this to the journalists we work with in um, the public broadcasting houses we're working with. And of course, it's on the long run our goal to build communities on third party platforms and to transfer them to our own platforms. So these are some thoughts today and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Sophie. Very interesting and very clear. Over to Magnus uh, Nistrom, please. Then we will open the Q&A session. Thank you, Maria. Just waiting for my slides to pop up. Here we go. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Great to be last in line. Uh, so I'm here to speak about innovation from a Nordic perspective to give some uh, some insights into Nordic Entertainment Group and predominantly our streaming service called Viaplay. To start off with, uh, we're uh, present basically in, in all Nordic countries, uh, including uh, and also UK. And uh, we've recently launched in Iceland. We comprise a number of different brands from traditional broadcasting uh, through radio stations, uh, content production, and so on. And I'll come back to that in terms of our unique offering. But pretty well spread across the Nordic, basically in almost uh, all Nordic households. Uh, and we have a UK operation, which actually kicked off already in the end of 80s when we challenged the Swedish monopoly in uh, television. Uh, looking at our content offering, it's fairly unique, fair to claim. Uh, everything is kind of based on four pillars. We do a series, which we acquire from uh, international companies. Movies, the same. We produce around 50,000 live sport hours a year with some of the big sport franchises being aired on our streaming services. Uh, the core pillar in all this is basically our studios business where we produce a lot of our own content. And actually the number now says around 20 originals 
will be released on our streaming platform. This year, it's actually moving up to 30. So we're investing quite heavily in the full length ecosystem here. So you could, it is fair to claim from an innovative perspective that we have a pretty broad offering from studios producing our own content through ingesting to our platforms and then airing it towards around 1,000, uh, sorry, 1 1.7 million unique subscribers to our services. If we look at the innovation side, I mean, a lot of people talked about broadcasting and television um, in the end of uh, 2007 to 2008, but we actually launched our service at that point in 2007 already. We launched our first version of the uh, streaming service called Viaplay. And then over the years, we have seen uh, multiple innovation steps being taken from our side. We were the first media house in the Nordics that actually aired the Olympics, first with Sochi in 2007 and then the Rio Games in 2016, which obviously triggers a lot of uh, innovation aspects built into the platform. And it's also important to state that coming back to a previous point in these speaking notes um, to kind of produce European technology, we have a very strong in-house capability built around our development community where we build a lot of things in-house in terms of the experience from a consumer side of things. In 2019, fair to claim that we also personalized our service to further tailor the experiences when, when using it. And last but not least, in 2020, as mentioned earlier, we launched the Iceland uh, being the fifth Nordic country going live on Viaplay. So what is on innovation in, in uh, seen from our perspective? Well, basically everything is centered around being autonomous. So we build experiences based on gathering a group of people that have a shared mission statement for their specific part of the product ecosystem and bring these passionate people together to create magic, hopefully. And if you look at it from a customer funnel perspective, we look at things from attract and acquisition, where the customer comes in and that whole experience that we want to build in our streaming services. It's the activation piece, getting people up and running and consuming the uh, content as such and hopefully find some relevant. The retention aspect, meaning keeping our customers loyal by serving the best type of content and experience. Then working with customer segments, obviously customers differs in terms of what they want to watch, kids, sports, section, and so on. So a lot of focus goes into that. And what ties this together from an experience perspective and the actual innovation side of things is the communication aspect, being able to curate content so that based on your viewing habits, we hopefully serve you the best type of content. And I try to summarize what I believe are important cornerstones in our culture in terms of bringing innovation to the table repeatedly. And these are spelled out in three key areas. Technical bravery. As mentioned earlier, we started off already 2007 with the first streaming service. And we have dared to take some bold decisions, not from a short-term perspective, but every decision we try, uh, we take, we try to have a long-term uh, perspective. Is this long-term sustainable? Secondly, experimental culture. We believe that being uh, innovative is all about bringing a group of people together to co-create our future and the experience ultimately for the customers when using our streaming platform. So we run a multiple uh, type of uh, experiments um, centered around the different missions each, each product team have, but they're very much allowed to uh, experiment and try new things, both technologic, uh, technically, but also in terms of the actual things being produced. We run so-called hack days and try to have a mindset where every day should be regarded as a hack day you should be able to experiment and bring your talent to life. And speaking about talent, obviously nurturing talent, I guess we all share that. How do you build people? How do you develop their competences? We invest a lot in this space, 
trying to get the right type of talent on board, stay and grow. So a lot of uh, um, actions goes into this area. To summarize, uh, our strategic priorities now and going is to develop, I think, class streaming. That's basically what we're all about nowadays. We want to offer the most relevant entertainment experiences across the different customer needs. We want to continue and attract international. I think we're around 30 nationalities in our development teams. So we speak a lot about diversity here as well. And last but not least, ensure a, ensure a sustainable approach to everything we do, both from an environmental and societal perspective. Yes, that's Nordic Entertainment Group in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Magnus. Uh, thank you to all our speakers for your interesting presentations.